My name is Steve Merksmer, and I am pleased to welcome all of you on behalf of PPIC's Board of Directors, and also pleased to present this program on corrections reform in California. Thank you, Senator Daryl Steinberg, Assemblymember Melissa Melendez, and California State Association of Counties Executive Director Matt Cate for joining us today for this important discussion. This event is part of PPIC's 2014 Speaker Series on California's Future. I would also like to thank the sponsors of this series for their underwriting support. They are, and the list is pretty long, so that's <laughs> good, Applied Materials Foundation, Bank of America, the Gruen Institute on Governance, the California Endowment, California Healthcare Foundation, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, the David and Susan Coulter Family Foundation, the James Irvine Foundation, Pacific Life Coulter Foundation, S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, Sierra Health now. Foundation, Southern California Edison, the Stewart Foundation, <laughs> Union Bank, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and Knowledge Partner, McKinsey and Company. So you can see Mark has done a very good job at, at gathering a lot of support for this effort. This um, series is also funded by PPIC's Donor Circle, the donor circle is comprised of individuals and organizations that provide unrestricted funds to help support our policy outreach and civic engagement. Funding from our sponsors and donor circle members makes programs like today's possible and ensures that they are free, like this one is, and open to the public. You can learn more about these programs on our website at www.ppic.org. So before we begin to very brief housekeeping issues first. Before you leave today, please take a moment to fill out the confidential evaluation survey found in your packet of materials and leave it at the registration table by the exit. And second, this is very important, please silence your cell phone. So now, on to the program. I'm pleased to introduce PPIC's President and CEO, Mark Baldessari, who will moderate today's conversation. So Mark, take it away. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And thanks, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's my pleasure to have such a distinguished panel here, and I'm going to introduce them individually, and we're going to get into the conversation uh, very soon. I want to uh, thank Steve, uh, who's on our board of directors, um, for making those uh, wonderful introductory comments. Also mention that Donna Lucas, our board chair, is here with us today, as well as Phil Eisenberg, who is a PPIC board member. Um, So I wanted to just, in order to set the context for this conversation, for those of you who may not be you know, living and breathing this topic as much as we are uh, at PPIC or all the, all the folks on this stage are, just, just to give you a, uh, some, some basic uh, uh, background about what, what we're going to be talking about. In, um, in August of 2009, the, uh, the federal courts uh, told the, the state of California that, uh, you, that we had to reduce our uh, prison population so that our prison population uh, would be um, uh, at 137 percent of state prison capacity in, instead of at the very uh, high level of, of overcrowding which uh, had occurred. And so that was the start of, uh, of where we are today in terms of our efforts to reach that uh, goal. In uh, May 2011, the uh, Supreme Court um, said that, uh, heard the case and said that uh, indeed, the state of California has to do this. Um, and in that same year, oh, and by the way, we had to do it by June 2013. Of course, June 2013 has come and gone now. Um, in that same year, in 2011, the state passed um, historic uh, change in the way we go about corrections. Uh, called AB 109, Corrections Realignment, moving down to the local level some of the responsibilities uh, for felons um, who, were, uh, who were previously um, uh, went to state prisons. And this was in an effort to reduce uh, the prison uh, uh, population, prison overcrowding. Um, by May 2012, it, it became clear that the state was not going to uh, be able to meet the uh, requirement of reducing the population by June 2013. We got an extension to April 18th, 2014. That would have been last Friday, right? Um, 
Well, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, so what happened in between was that the state um, uh, earlier this year got another extension. Um, in, in early January, got an extension that by February 26th, uh, 2016, we have to reduce our prison population uh, to meet that 137% threshold. Meanwhile, we have been making uh, uh, progress uh, as measured by the degree of, uh, of, of uh, uh, prison overcrowding, uh, but we're not uh, at that point yet. And there are thousands of, uh, we're, we're thousands away from reaching that threshold. And that brings us to our discussion today as to uh, what, uh, what the state has been doing uh, and what, what types of innovative programs and what types of current programs and, and what's working and what's not working. And why I've uh, uh, been fortunate to get the three, the three people on the stage who are, who are here today to discuss this. And let me just briefly um, introduce them. They don't really need any introduction, but I, but I, I enjoy doing it, so, I'll, <laughs> so bear with me for a moment. Uh, Daryl Steinberg, um, who has been in the uh, State Senate since uh, 2006 and has been the Senate President since 2008. And previously, he spent uh, six years in the Assembly, which if you're doing the math like I am right now, means that this is his last year. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and clearly, having started in 2008, if you listen to my timeline, uh, Daryl's been through all of this, right? He, he's been through, uh, through the, the 2009 and the 2011 and the request for extension and everything else. Um, Matt Kate. Who, uh, who, who became the president of the California State Association of Counties uh, in 2012. Prior to that was the Secretary of Corrections appointed by, uh, by Governor Schwarzenegger in 2008 and then ex his, he remained Secretary of Corrections up until his appointment um, uh, as, uh, through Jerry Brown's um, uh, uh, tenure, um, uh, at least the first few years of his tenure. So uh, Matt has also lived with this um, as, as his, in his capacity as um, Secretary of Corrections. Um, the original requirements to meet the, the court orders and then, um, and then the corrections realignment, trying to implement that. And now he's on the other side of, uh, of, of the equation, so to speak, uh, with local government now uh, who's been given the responsibilities. Last but not least, um, the future of the California legislature is with, uh, with people like Assembly Member uh, Melissa Melendez. Uh, uh, the Assembly Member came in um, uh, a year ago uh, through the top two primary and the independent redistricting, uh, was part of a record class of, of new legislators uh, through those uh, legislative reforms with the possibility also uh, as a result of changes that, that, that the voters made um, uh, of being in uh, the current seat in the assembly for up to 12 years. And I understand that you have no competition this year, is that right? You so scared them all off. Yep. You scared them all off. So um, uh, I had, had the pleasure of meeting uh, the assembly member a year ago uh, when we went around and met all the new uh, assembly members who were coming in under these very unique uh, circumstances. And when I realized that um, uh, that Melissa had been appointed uh, the vice chair of the public safety uh, committee for the assembly felt that uh, this would be an ideal situation of having somebody who um, is in the assembly um, as well as somebody in the Senate, a Democrat, Republican, somebody who, who reflects uh, both uh, local issues now and state issues um, and uh, somebody who has grappled with these issues and someone over the, over the next several years will be, um, uh, unless they all go away somehow this year, but, uh, but probably not. So uh, to start our conversation today, um, one of the big uh, factors now in trying to reduce uh, prison overcrowding and reduce the prison population uh, will be um, an emphasis on rehabilitation. Um, Rehabilitation is important because the more you rehabilitate uh, people who had been um, in prison or jail, the less likely that they will be uh, going back for a second time in crowding our uh, prisons. And so the first question I'd like to, to ask for each of you is, um, 
how will the state's renewed focus on rehabilitation um, help the state reduce the prison population by 2016? And why don't we start with Daryl, Daryl, and we'll just go in line for this first question. First of all, thank you very much, Mark, uh, and the PPIC for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be on, uh, on this panel with my colleagues. And if I may, just to make an introductory comment uh, and answer your question, of course, just about how fascinating for any student of government this whole story is. Whether you're interested in the issues of federalism, the relationship between the state and federal government, the separation of powers within our state government, this could be a PhD thesis or a, or a law school exam when you think about it. The federal courts intervening and telling the state how to run its prison population because of issues relating to the Eighth Amendment prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment the governor of the state of California, the legislature with appropriations authority, the plaintiffs, the defendants, 10 years worth of litigation, and all this sort of mixed together, and all of us with separate authorities and separate powers that have led us to this point. And to answer your question, I think it's important to note that the overcrowding issue cannot be looked at at one moment in time. It may matter to the court, and will matter to the court, whether we get to 137 and a half at the, at the new prescribed time. But that really isn't the issue. The issue is whether or not we can maintain uh, whatever the appropriate level is. And I maintain uh, very strongly that unless we begin significantly redirecting resources from leasing prison and jail space to substance abuse and mental health care and treatment, that we may reach that magic number at one point in time, but we will not maintain it. And in fact, we run the risk of blowing the hole in whatever the appropriate number we, we believe is right. This last year, and I'll turn it over, was a significant turning point in my view. Governor Brown, who in my view has done an exemplary job in leading the state uh, towards this necessary realignment policy, the legislature, beleaguered legislature sometimes deserves a lot of credit as well in terms of partnering with the governor. But that took our prison population down from about 142,000 to less than 120, but still overcrowded. And when we got to this last chapter in 2013, when he and we were faced with compliance, we had two choices. One was to lease more jail space in state and out of state to deal with the remaining overcrowding. The other is to ask the court for one more extension and to say specifically that we would use whatever dollars saved by not having to spend on leasing that jail space. We would instead invest that in Reentry, mental health and substance abuse treatment to reduce the 65% or so recidivism rate. We compromised with the governor in August, we passed SB 105, which says that every dollar saved as a result of that extension and not having the least jail space goes into recidivism reduction. The governor's January budget has $80 million or so in that fund. We aim, if the May revision is good, to actually increase that amount of funding so that counties and its providers can have the resources to deal with rehabilitation. So I think we're starting now to move in the right direction with a long way to go. Melissa? Uh, well, thank you again for having me and I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to uh, be on this stage with these fine gentlemen who've been in this business a little longer than I have. But um, I come from the local government uh, arena so I, you know I walked into this with a different perspective because I'd already been hearing about the problems coming from my sheriffs and coming from my local law enforcement folks um, and I would agree with the senator that the 81.1 million I think it is that the governor uh, wants to set aside for this rehabilitation I think that's not enough um, because this this issue of overcrowding uh, 
it doesn't seem that it's going away anytime soon. We may be able to get the numbers down, and we will get the numbers down because the court said we have to, but we'll get the numbers down. But then, you know, we have a projected increase of prison population to factor in as well, which is what, 0.6%, they say they expect the prison population to increase over the next few years. So we have to account for that. So the problem's not going away. Um, so do we need more beds? Yes. Do we need to keep more people out of our prisons? Yes. And the way you do that is, in my opinion, first at least focus on uh, the ones who are probably most easily rehabilitated, and that's the young people. You know, get these kids, when they're young, um, when they haven't developed particular habits that they're going to have for the rest of their lives, get them then. Teach them a different way of life, teach them a different path, better choices, show them that there is a chance for them out there. That is the demographic that we stand to, to gain the most ground with, I think. Uh, so I would like to see more money you know, diverted to helping these kids, whether it's mentally ill, whether it's uh, you know, different programs that they want to put into place to, to get them on the right path, whatever it is, please, let's start with the kids because I don't want to see them come back as adult offenders later on, and I think that's oftentimes um, what happens. So I, I do agree that this is a good start, but not to belabor the point, I want to share my time um, on the stage here with my colleagues, but we have a lot of programs out there, and no one seems to be able to tell me if they work. And I don't know why that is. Uh, everyone seems to have a great idea and a great program and sincerity behind it, behind the suggestion. But there has been no analysis of do all these programs work, are they effective? I can tell you that they're not all effective, but some are. There's one in Senator Steinberg's district, as a matter of fact, that um, has proven to be very successful. And so we community-based programs, I don't remember the exact name of it. It's it's a program in, the, in this program. right. Yeah. It's it's a a program in his district that has proven to be successful. So, you know, we had um, an assembly member who said, you know what, this works. So let's expand it throughout the rest of the state, and it was met with resistance because of the cost. But my argument is, if you have something that you know works, then model the rest of the state after it. And if you have other programs you can't prove that work you have no tangible proof that they do something effective, then don't pay for those. I don't understand why we're paying for things that don't work. Let's use the best practices and uh, let's not reinvent the wheel. So, thank you. Yeah, again, I'd uh, echo my colleagues. I'm just very pleased to be here. It's quite a pleasure and honor to share the stage um, with uh, these two leaders in the legislature on, on this issue. Um, you know, my um, entry point in public safety was as a prosecutor, and uh, I was a short-term thinker. A file comes across your desk, you take it to trial, you ask for a prison sentence or a jail sentence, and you move on to the next file, and you don't have to think about that person ever again. But when you start to get involved in corrections, you realize that 95% of those people that that went to prison after that trial are now back in the same county where they started. And so you begin to think about rehabilitation as uh, an important long-term solution. Um, the, the difficulty with uh, the question you posed for me is that as I think about <clears throat> the importance of rehabilitation and meeting a number in 2016, it's very difficult for the state to do. Um, I just noticed, in fact, the changes that, that Senator Steinberg and, and Governor Schwarzenegger and, and the other leaders in 2008 made, they made an investment in rehabilitation at that time. We've just seen those offenders have served their time, they've been released, they've been now on parole for three years, we've studied the outcome and we've seen corrections reported a 5% reduction in recidivism last year. So here we are in 2014 learning about the impacts of what we did in 2008. And so to think about, I think it's the right thing to continue to invest in rehabilitation at a state level, um, especially I would recommend uh, trying to invest in that key piece of, of uh, aftercare. So the, those first six months after someone has been um, in a program and then released from prison, that's a great statewide investment that may show short-term dividends to have an impact in 2016. 
but you know, at the risk of being a little self-serving, the, these people are turning around in county jails in, in six months. And so the investment in rehabilitation at the local level can have a very immediate impact. And hopefully we can, at the local level, continue to reduce the numbers that we're sending to state prison in the first place. This gets back, I think, to the discussion about you know, early intervention. And then I think, so your best chance of reducing the prison population with rehabilitation happens uh, with those uh, offenders at the local level. So uh, let me follow up on some comments that have been made in, in your initial uh, remarks. Um, I, I'm hearing two kinds of uh, programs. I'm, I'm hearing uh, programs that have to do with um, people who have been in prison and are going to be rehabilitated, but I'm also hearing about programs that would be directed, it seems to me, at people who aren't offenders yet, who, who are in their youth. And uh, where are we going to be, from a public policy standpoint, where are we going to be effective? And, and, and can we be, do we know enough right now to say, if we put $80 million in such and such a program, we know there's going to be a difference. So in, in what type of programs um, and at what stage? Um, if I may, um, that's a very good point. And so we don't want to throw money around everywhere we can just to see if it works. That's not the most efficient use of taxpayer dollars, I would agree. But there are uh, other areas of the country who have had success in this arena that we should be looking at. Los Angeles, by the way, is for an example. That's right here in California. They've seen significant improvement in, in their prison system and reducing the number of people who are entering into the system, how did they do that? Let's find out. New York did the same thing. Um, New York, you know, their, their prison population fell in it and it wasn't because they used realignment practices like we did. They used other methods. So this is not something that has to be uh, created in some lab somewhere in California where this has already been done. Let's figure out how they did it and employ those tactics. If I may, we do have some evidence uh, already and Matt talked a little bit about that a moment ago, but let me illustrate a couple of different approaches that have been proven to work. In 2009, my colleague Senator Mark Leno introduced SB 678. The idea between six, uh, behind 678 was to say to counties, if you can divert your felony probationers from returning back to state prison or going to state prison, whatever savings is generated as a result, and the savings were based on what it would cost to put that person in a prison bed for a year, about $25,000 a bed was the estimate, that we will give you half the savings. And so in 2011, when they evaluated this, 678, Senator Leno's bill, diverted over 9,500 offenders from going to state prison. The action resulted in a state savings of $284 million, $536 million over the course of three years. Now, we cut that program in 2012, and as part of SB 105, the compromise we made with the governor, we've now reinstated that. So add that reimbursement, because the counties will get half the money going forward to the 81 million we have in recidivism reduction, and make more of that investment, we'll be on our way. Secondly, I agree wholeheartedly with this notion that if we don't put most of our money into prevention and early intervention, that we are missing it. When I was a new assembly member back in 99, I introduced AB 34 and 2034, which were the integrated services for the homeless mentally ill. They were the precursors for Proposition 63, the Mental Health Services Act. And what we found through those approaches with a case management approach and with using the money for whatever it takes, not siloing it, as long as you meet the diagnosis of having a serious mental illness, you can use the money for substance abuse treatment, mental illness, of course, housing, vocational assistance, we found huge reductions in hospitalization, jail time, days of homelessness. Prop 63 is now 
doing the same at a much larger scale. They're way behind in terms of outcome-based evaluation, which I'm not happy about and have made that very, very clear. But they're doing, that, they're doing that work. Now we need to do the same thing in the criminal justice system. Once folks are in and they get out, we need to apply the same kind of methodology, case management, supportive housing, uh, using the money for whatever it takes and then measure measure the whatever it takes approach and if, and if we have the same kind of success we've had for people before they enter jail or prison in the first place, we'll have a lot of success. Well, uh, I think just to quickly address the, the pro tems comments, uh, I can tell you this, once, if you don't intervene early, once a mentally ill offender hits the prison system and the parole system, they recidivate, they reoffend uh, over a three year period at a rate of 80% plus. Very difficult for these mentally ill offenders to find their way out of the criminal justice system once they're in. And so very smart, I think, to, to intervene early and try to prevent that just from the beginning. And then second, secondly, I think also this idea that the assembly member brought out of looking elsewhere, I, a number of uh, conservative states are in, in now involved in justice reinvestment. They're taking this principle of, let's see if we can reduce our spending and then take some of the savings and, and try to put it in evidence-based programs. Mark, your question was, do we know what works and what doesn't? Um, I think if you look at the literature across the country, we have a lot of information about what works. Uh, metadata concerning uh, what's been successful elsewhere. The difficulty is you have to know enough about your offender to be able to say, are we applying the right program to the right person who needs it? And then are we doing that with some fidelity? Are we doing it correctly? Because it doesn't, it doesn't help to have a great program that's worked elsewhere if we're not applying it to the right person and we're not doing it in the right way. Okay. So uh, let me follow up with, uh, with this question. I, I was reading a story over the weekend that Don Thompson from the AP wrote. Is he here today? He's over uh, in there in the corner taking notes. Oh, okay. Let, let, let's, right. let's put and, him on the panel. And um, he, I, what, what interested me, uh, what caught my attention, was there was a quote from, from our governor, Governor Brown, say, saying that uh, he said, I can report that uh, realignment is working today. And I'm wondering, uh, having listened to all of you talk about what, what state we are in, in terms of uh, applying some of the best knowledge we know to solving the problem, uh, along with the fact that we're not at the goals that we set. How do you feel about what the governor said about, uh, is realignment working today? I guess, what does working mean in this case, right? Well, that's what I was gonna say was, depends on your definition of working, yeah. I guess. Um, because my county, Riverside County, within months of realignment going into effect, jails are full, packed, already impacted. So. Are we moving people out of prison? Are uh, the conditions improving there? I would think so, but to what end? Because we've seen that property crime, you know, auto theft, things of that nature have gone up since realignment went into effect. There's no correlation between violent crime, but we certainly see a correlation with those types of crimes. So that is something that affects our community. So if you ask your community members, is realignment working? Uh, I would say they would suggest that it's not, not to the way that they would like to see. Um, but again, I think, you know, he made a very good point that programs work elsewhere. Um, are they working here? The programs we have in place haven't been evaluated. I don't, there is no tangible evidence to say this is an effective program here. So how we keep throwing money at this problem, we keep tweaking it and trying to change how it looks without even knowing what we have right now. So as politicians, we want to make sure that the money that we are allocating for these services is working, that it's doing what we promised our constituents it would do. And I don't see any proof of that yet that that has actually happened. And that is a, that is a major policy flaw in this whole discussion that I don't think uh, it's not an easy discussion to have, but that is the reality, and 
so if you ask me, do I think it's working? Again, I think it depends on your definition. And from, from the average community member's um, standpoint, I, again, I would say that they would say no. I mean, you have people who know it's a revolving door. Um, we need to fix that. We need to figure out how to, how to address that issue so that we don't have uh, news stories on a frequent basis of an AB 109er who, who didn't serve his time or who was released a little earlier and then goes out and murders someone. You know, I, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I think um, there's some very valid points there. One of the, the things that we need to keep in mind is that is it working as compared to what? So, you know, if we go back in time, it's only been a couple of years, but we were facing a prisoner release order of the magnitude of, of 35,000 inmates and emptying uh, 30, you know, seven prisons onto the streets of California was no option. And so that's why the, the sheriffs and probation chiefs, police chiefs got behind realignment. Not that we knew enough to really say that with confidence that this is gonna work, but we knew enough to say that this option facing us from the courts was, was not going to work. Um, and since then, the courts have said, well, that was good, but not good enough, it turns out. There's even more work to be done, as has been said. The other thing that I am confident in, in is that as I go to the counties and I talk to local law enforcement, they, uh, I hear very consistently that they are working together through um, their um, community um, uh, partnerships, through those meetings, those law enforcement meetings where the probation chiefs are leading the other county law enforcement officials and city officials in, in trying to figure out what's the best way to, to handle our community problems. I mean, a lot of positive feedback about those meetings and about the collaboration between law enforcement um, and uh, the courts and uh, the, the folks that are working in social services. So uh, successful in, in that regard, certainly, and probably too early to say, you know, overall in a, in a grand mm -hmm. scheme, what part of it is, is working best uh, versus something else. Well, Matt said it a slightly different way than the way I would say it, but I make the same point. Public policy making is a matter of choices, but I would assert that when it comes to our decision to pass realignment in 2011, it really wasn't a choice. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, I think it was the right choice, but there really wasn't a choice because of what Matt just described. Not only uh, were the prisons overcrowded and continued to be, but I look at the PPIC polling that was part of my preparation packet for this panel, and the public does not, and the public does not support increased funding uh, for, for corrections. And so the question is, is not whether or not realignment is working. I think it is beginning to work. The question is, what are we all going to do now to assure that it absolutely works? Now, well, this is correct. I mean, in, in the sense, there is going to be a newspaper story. There already have been about somebody who, uh, AB 109er commits a crime. But you know what? I've said this many times. Philip Garrido committed his crimes under the old parole-based system. And so, you know, people can always, and you're not doing this, but in our world, people can politicize these things very easily, but we all have to, you know, be smart about it, and and I'm sure the public's going to be smart about it too. That when they begin to see a reduction in the recidivism rate, when they see less money spent on corrections, when they see more money spent on mental health, substance abuse, and youth prevention kinds of strategies, uh, I think that this will take hold. And the last thing is that this kind of major change doesn't bear the tangible result that we all want in the public policy world in six months or one year or two years or five years. But we have to measure. I'm frustrated that we don't have enough data. And you, and you point this out as well. And we, ought to, we need to be data driven because we, only need, we, we need to be investing and replicating the things that are working. So I say yes, it's a success because it was a necessary choice to make and I think that it's being implemented in uh, maybe imperfect way but in the right way by our counties and by, by, by the state. So, uh, you know, I'm hearing from each of you in a different way, a different, slightly different voice that um, 
we don't have enough data. Right? You're saying well, that we, we don't, don't share the data. We don't I have think. enough data to to know whether we should be making this investment or that one. Um, Daryl, you're saying we know that that some things work, um, but we'd like to know more. We right? need to know more. Uh, and, I, and I heard in different ways from Matt. We're a very technologically advanced state when it comes to private industry. Why are why are we not more advanced when it comes to to data? to evaluation, to monitoring programs, to, Ask to deciding what works. Longer. Ask me. <laughs> well, number one, it's hard work. Um, we, ask a lot of our, we ask a lot of our service providers, for example, and I want to over-dramatize this, but we ask our service providers to save lives, to save souls, right? And the data piece of this is, is, is difficult. It's difficult to collect, and we also need to do the underlying work around what we, what we seek to measure. For example, you talk about recidivism. I could make an argument, but it wouldn't be very credible, that our recidivism rate has been reduced dramatically because the state prison population is dropping. But that's not the right way to do it, because you can also look at arrests. You can look at uh, whether people reoffend in, in, in a number of different ways. So it's, a lot, it's, it's hard work. But I also think there needs to be more of a will. And I know I, I say this with the Mental Health Service Act, Prop 63, all the time, where I know, because I'm into it and I talk to people, where thousands of lives are being saved. But it's taxpayer dollars, and they have not yet done an outcome-based evaluation to show the public that that's the truth. So the fact that I say it, as a politician from Sacramento, is not enough. And if we're going to fuel a redirection of resources towards the things that we know intuitively work, then we're going to have to have to make data and outcome-based evaluation a priority. Okay, so let, let, I want to hear from, from uh, our other uh, colleagues, but I read the LAO report. That was in my packet of preparation for today. It was very <laughs> critical, very critical of the fact that there were $81 million set aside for the Recidivism Reduction Fund and uh, really not a lot of evidence-based um, uh, factual best practices, evaluation about Mark. which programs are going to work. Mark, we have not written a budget yet. This so, is, that's, that's the governor's proposal. We now write, we now write the budget. Are you telling me but, that we can expect this in the budget then? Yes. Okay. I am telling you, you can expect data and, and the requirement of outcome-based evaluation for that $81 million plus And is this the something that the uh, Republicans, you think, in, in, in your caucus would, would uh, approve of? This use of data, uh, use of funds for uh, more, more data, more evaluation? I, I do think uh, they would be supportive of that. Um, you know, the, the point has been, I mean, it's the big elephant in the room, though, is that we haven't seen any results. So we have uh, people who have been assigned, who have been tasked with this responsibility on the board to uh, oversee the rehabilitation efforts. I have yet to see a report that tells me what works and what doesn't work. And my question is, what have you been doing? Where's the data? Where's the report so that we know what we're spending our money on? So for me, I'm, I'm less inclined, I, you know, I want to say, look, no more money until you give the report that you promised to give so we know how to move forward. Um, the data is a huge issue because we're not sharing. We have these different organizations, but they can't share the information. So what good does that do anyone, right? And how do you come up with solutions and policies collectively if you don't know what Daryl knows and what Matt knows and what I know, it doesn't work. So yes, it's an expensive venture. Technology isn't cheap. It's worth it, but it's expensive. But there are so many other pieces that have to go along with this, but the reality is yes, in the it's 2014, okay? We need to get with the program and, and, and get all this information in one place so people can cull from it and, and come up with sound policy decisions, not just throwing things around and seeing what sticks. That's not working, that's a waste of money. Matt, let me, let me ask you, um, because you represent the counties and the counties through realignment have been really given uh, the responsibility, not just for data collection, but for 
uh, changing outcomes and, and really changing people's lives, you know, through rehabilitation um, uh, and, and ending uh, the, the pattern of recidivism that we've had. Um, you know, this state has had <laughs> some mixed experiences with uh, realignment uh, in which uh, the state asks local governments to do things. Is the state giving the tool, has the state given the tools to local government to succeed? Or has the state really set up local governments for failure? Hmm. Can I pass? Good answer. No. <laughs> um, well, um, uh, the, the local government has been asked to do a lot. The truth is, is realignment came in, at, not only were we facing a massive prisoner release order, but also a $26 billion deficit at the state. And so what, we could, what, we, what the state wanted to do and what it could afford were different. And so counties are being asked just to make this work with about 63 cents on the dollar that, that my agency was spending on these same offenders. So how much of that other 37 cents do you need to succeed? Well, it depends on which county you're referring to. Okay. Um, because frankly, in some counties, we're driving down recidivism rates right now better than the state has ever done. I mean, it is, it is, we're getting fantastic results in many counties, and they would say, well, you should double down on us because we can drive those crime rates even lower and those recidivism rates even lower. On the other hand, there's some counties who started out in a really tough place. Um, those, there are sheriffs who will tell you exactly how many offenders they've had to release early uh, because of jail crowding, something they had to do before, keep in mind, realignment, and something they're doing perhaps even more now. They'll tell you those numbers. Probation chiefs will tell you about the offenders they're unable to effectively supervise or treat because they, could, they need more dollars to do that. And typically where you see this are places where the economy was hitting them hardest um, you know, in, over the last five years. And, and you see it in places where they just didn't have the resources to address infrastructure needs you know, along the way. The interesting thing to me, though, is that as I talk to those leaders, many of whom in rural California that are struggling with resources, what they're not struggling with is intellectual resources. Mm. I'm seeing a, a real uh, groundswell of um, support for uh, rehabilitative programming, for early intervention. There are some folks who come from very conservative counties who will tell you, you know, we've got it figured out. We understand what evidence-based programs are and we're ready to go, but we need continued investment to get up to speed from where perhaps our neighbors you know, started a little bit ahead of us. And so um, it's, it's hard to put a number on it, but I know the, the governor and the legislature, they're, you know, they're riding the circuit. They're visiting jails. They're going to see uh, probation chiefs. They're talking to city uh, police chiefs and asking how much, how are you doing? What do you need? And, and in this state, the, you have 58 different answers. Okay, so mixed, uh, mixed. results. Melissa, what, what, what do you think? Well, has, has the state given uh, the locals what they need to succeed in realignment? I think that, um, I think the intent was to help the locals and the counties uh, with whatever they needed to make this successful. I think the reality is they don't have those resources right now. Um, my county, my DA uses split sentencing a lot. Um, because out of necessity, he needs to. Other counties are hesitant to do that, but split sentencing, if done correctly, um, can work. But I, then I go to my youth facilities, and I see that the programs that should be in place are absent. And so those kids, they're going to end up in the, in the adult facility at some point in time because they're not being helped when they're the most malleable, right? Um, so, no, I don't think that the counties have everything they need, uh, but I think counties also need to be more vocal about specifically what it is they need. And then when they're given the funds, let the counties decide how best to spend that money. I, they do not need me or Senator Steinberg telling them how to spend their money. They know better because, as Matt said, every county is different. So let them spend the money the way they think it's going to be most helpful. Um, that's the best way. And I think the governor is very supportive of that, of that idea. In fact, I think he mentioned that in one of the articles that I read, that he really wants us to be 
um, the locals driving how this money is spent. But again, if they don't have if they don't have the dollars to spend on the programs that have already been proven to work, then we're spinning our wheels. So here's maybe a little bit of a controversial statement, but um, sometimes the state wants to leave it to the locals and sometimes we don't. For example, the governor proposes $500 million in the budget for local jail construction. Now, the counties need more. We've, we've granted, I believe, about $1.7 billion with two different measures over the last five years, but now it's $500 million more. That money goes through the sheriffs, who we, we, we love, and they're a huge part of uh, the law enforcement coalition. We could say, let's give that money to the counties and leave it up to them to how to spend it. For example, do you want to do mental health beds? Uh, do, you want to, do, do you want to improve your mental health system or your, or your resources for substance abuse treatment? That's going to be a, a budget and policy decision that we need to make. I would say overall, of course, we're not doing enough. Remember, this policy was both policy-driven and budget-driven. I'm talking about realignment. Mm -hmm. And because it was budget-driven, uh, we were operating and continuing to some degree to operate in a, in a period of diminished resources, if there's one area where I think the state ought to be doing more, it's what I call the category of triage. Because you can have all the good services in the world, but if you don't have the linkages in the system to make sure that somebody gets from an emergency room or a jail uh, or a homeless shelter or the back bedroom of their older parents home to the service that they need, you're gonna always have people falling through the cracks. And we have a unique opportunity. Last year, we put about $360 million into better mental health services, but we didn't focus it on services themselves. Instead, we're funding, and the money's just going out, 2,000 crisis beds in counties, 600 triage workers, 25 mobile outreach teams. We funded, um, mental health and substance abuse now through the state's Medi-Cal program, which means that when people leave jails with these kinds of problems or leave state prison with these kinds of problems, that they can and must immediately be signed up for health care so that provision can kick in and we don't have to just rely on the public programs, but they can then enroll in the private insurance programs as well. Finally, the number one thing I think we could do in the criminal justice system as it relates to rehabilitation is fund more mental health and substance abuse specialty courts. And I know that this is hard in the era where we're cutting back court funding, but there must be a quarterback in this system, a good quarterback, a 49er court, no, a, <laughs> a, a, a quarterback who can make sure that that individual, as a condition of probation, for example, enrolls in those services, can maintain the contact with the program, et cetera. If we don't do that and let people just sort of on their way and hope that they're going to get better, they're not, and they're gonna come back into the system. Let me ask each of you, because um, I, I wanna uh, give a chance for our uh, folks in the audience to ask questions. Uh, one closing question, and then if I have some time, I'd like to get back to it later. Uh, what do you most want to see happen this year related to rehabilitation, reducing prison sentences, and most happen through the legislative process? Matt. Uh, well, I give credit to the governor for his budget. He listened to counties and he put forward, a, in our view, a good, a good budget. Uh, mm -hmm. It addresses issues around um, the fact that we should not be incarcerating individuals for 20 years in a county jail cell, where okay. there's no uh, space for rehabilitation, there's no place for exercise. We have to rein that in, just as one example. And he, there are several others in his budget that I think- So you just want us to pass the budget? The way it is. Uh, well, budget plus, I think. Plus, okay. Um, you know, as uh, realignment funding uh, is going to dip this year, I'm concerned about that. Uh, I was talking to uh, the supervisors in Yolo County, for example. They just opened a new day reporting center, a, a quarterback for some of these offenders to come out and get services. And as funding goes down, that's the first thing they're going to have to cut. 
Now, that's not true in all counties, but I'm concerned about that. I, I do think we need to address the issue Senator Steinberg brought up concerning getting folks attached to the programs, Prop 63, which, which he led on. Okay. Uh, these, uh, these rehabilitation dollars, uh, SB 82 on the crisis beds. Uh, so I do want to see some progress okay. there uh, as well in the, in the coming year. Melissa, what do you most want to see come out of this uh, year that would, would have the biggest impact on rehabilitation? I Prison think um, a little more accountability when it comes to the funding would go a long way. I think that should come from the legislature, a demand that um, these programs are accounted for and the dollars are accounted for. And I would like to see, and I know this sounds strange coming from a Republican, but I would like to see more money directed towards the rehabilitative efforts specifically for uh, the younger offenders. I really think that's key. I'm not suggesting that we cannot rehabilitate um, the, some in the adult population, but I, you know, you know as well as I do that there are some that cannot be rehabilitated. So let's figure out those who can, and that comes from identifying them, you know, early on and put them in the programs they need to be in. But really, let's let's not allow our population to grow substantially by letting those kids. Um, who, who we could help now, letting them just to their own devices and ending up in the adult system. I think that's hugely important and there's a lot of ways we can do that. But I think direction needs to come from the legislature um, to that effort. And last but not least, not the, least. the Senate pro tem. The Recidivism Reduction Fund established under SB 105 is by definition intended to be county driven. And what I would like to see is that 81 million, depending upon the May revision, if the, if the May re revise is good, I would like to see that increased significantly. Can you define but significant? I'd I like can't. to see it doubled. Okay. All right? <laughs> I'd like to see it doubled. I'd like to see right. it doubled, but, but partnered with Assemblymember Melendez's plea, and it's mine as well, and I think it's Matt Cates as well, with a commitment in statute to consistently report to the legislature, the governor, and the people outcome-based evaluations based upon the expenditure of those dollars. I'm confident that the evaluations are going to be very positive as we fund the evidence-based practices that we already know work in our communities, but I think that is essential. Now, we can only double the money if we have a good, if we have a good May revision, and we'll see, you know, that's a little bit out of our control at this point, but um, that's what I would hope to see, so we can invest in mentally, mentally ill crime uh, offender reduction grants and the whole range of other strategies that um, the counties can best deploy. Uh, Daryl, I'm seeing your colleagues on the stage nod in agreement, so, you know, you maybe deal. we came you up with something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is the way it works, huh? Hey, you know, it, <laughs> nice. right it works more often than not, actually. Excellent. Good. And, and I'm seeing that uh, on, on the local level, uh, you're, you're, you're getting uh, high fives for this, too. <laughs> so good. We have, a time, we have time for a few questions from our audience. I know you've all come from, yes, from afar to join us today. We appreciate it. And I, I, I want to make sure that we've, we've, we've uh, accounted for your questions. Hi, um, my name is Darlene Anderson, and I just would like to really think about the focus on education. Because if African American children are not being successful in California, and they are heavily populating the prison system, when are we going to start holding our local school districts accountable? Because everything is a local issue. Education is local too. We need more accountability in the educational system so we have more people graduating and productive and ready to work. And this, I think that's where the focus really needs to thank be. Thank you. And, and this brings us full circle from uh, comments earlier about investing in youth, right? So does anybody want to um, want to address that? Or, or, no? <laughs> He's looking at me. Uh, okay, I will address that. You want to? Do you want me to? Do you want to? We can do it you together. Can we do it together? <laughs> okay. Yeah, no. Okay, but I quickly, will be, I will I want be take brief. Some more yeah. Um, because that's a really, that boy, that's a huge issue to address. And I know we want to give everyone an opportunity to ask their questions. Um, I understand what you're saying. I think yeah, you're right, there, there needs to be an effort um, in the school system also 
to make sure these kids don't end up in the system. But I would like to add to that because I think our, our teachers, our school administrators need to be held to a standard as well. Parents need to be held to a standard too, right? Yeah. So the families okay. need to take part and partner with the teachers and okay. in the, in the school administrators to make sure these kids are on the right path. Maybe it's because I only have um, seven months and seven days left in my in in, in my and, term but I, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of anxious to do a lot this year <laughs> and recognize that there are always limitations but one of the priorities in the state must be early childhood education mm -hmm. and preschool for four-year-olds I mean the the brain science is clear you know there's we did a lot with education last year by increasing funding and especially increasing funding for disadvantaged kids that needs to be matched now with a series of programmatic initiatives, early childhood education, career pathways for high school students so that they have a pathway to a high wage job, and uh, we'll, we can reduce this corrections budget most by doing smart things in education. I agree. There was a question back here, and then there's a question over here, so maybe we can take that one next. And can, uh, look, can we have like a short question, <laughs> if possible? <laughs> Well, Less this a isn't a short question. <laughs> so, oh, well. I'll state it in a short way. When, why is it that none of the great thinkers and these intelligent people who make these decisions consider the fact that when you put a person in prison and subject them to worse conditions than gorillas in the zoo, when you allow them to be raped and bullied and hurt and shanked and everything else, they're not going to come out and be model citizens. They're going to become survivalists. They're going to become worse and they're going to be broken. Why don't we address the human rights violations? Let, let me ask um, Matt to um, uh, respond to your question because you know Matt's been Secretary of Corrections uh, and, and I know these are, these are issues that uh, I'm sure you've, you've grappled with. Sure, well, and before I was Secretary of Corrections, I was the Inspector General of the prison system. Yeah. So my, my job, along with the Inspector General's office, to uh, investigate and, and publicly report on waste, fraud, and abuse in, in California's prisons. And, you know, it, that was an easy job, right? <laughs> Going around and picking up rocks and identifying problems in, a, in an overcrowded prison system is, is uh, especially with someone with my background, that's, that's easy. Uh, the hard part is, is doing something about it. And it's especially hard when the prisons were at 200% overcrowding. The truth is it became, uh, in my opinion, uh, really unmanageable. Because you can tell that, that offender A needs, he needs rehabilitation, you know, he needs drug and alcohol uh, counseling, he needs uh, anger management, he's got these problems. And we've got those, those um, programs in this facility over here, but if there's not a bed for him, that doesn't do you any good. And so prison administrators, and, and part of selling realignment was telling county officials, this is your prison system. It's not mine or the governor's or, or the legislature's, it's, it's yours, county officials, right? It's yours, citizens, you people here in this room, it's your prison system. And so we needed to do something about crowding first, because everything became log jammed, and even well-meaning, intelligent, caring human beings that were responsible for their fellow human beings in prisons could do nothing to improve their lot while we were in this massive overcrowding problem. And so for, if nothing else, realignment has helped to relieve that. And now we can hold prison um, administrators and, and the administration legislature accountable for seeing improvements in human rights and seeing improvements in, in getting people out of this system and, and seeing violence come down. I think all of those, you're absolutely right in terms of we have this, this heavy responsibility for people that we incarcerate to make sure that, that we're not uh, treating them poorly or, or not forgetting about them. But the first step was to, to, to end the deadlock and I think that the, our leadership deserves some credit for at least taking that important first step. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Senator Steinberg, um, Assemblywoman. 
we deal with lifers, my organization deals with lifers, and as back to the data collection, there is one, one group that we have a lot of data on, and that is the lifers and the remarkably low recidivism rate for anyone who has been released after serving a life term. And yet most of the programs that we see as far as rehabilitation, wraparound services, all of those things that are being, being introduced now specifically exclude lifers. So my question is, when can we see some action on this, the cohort that we can reduce recidivism rate even more, and we know we can safely release them. Why are we not seeing more programs to help this happen? Well, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge that this is in some ways the, the toughest group, right, because of the nature of, oftentimes the nature of the crimes that they have committed. Um, and I know those statistics, and I know that um, the rates of, uh, uh, of parole now are, are going up a, a little bit uh, over the last couple of years. I, I, I think we should apply these programs um, to as many people as we can, but if I were to state a priority, a priority needs to be with the first offender, the second offender, the, 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 the young person who's new to the system because they're the ones that we may have the best chance to avoid becoming lifers. Uh, down the line. Um, I, I would like to see the lifers get more programming, but I think that the emphasis and the priority needs to be in other places. Okay. One more question. Yes. This is going to be a great question. It's got to be. It's, it's the last one, it's, right? It's, you know, I can keep it really simple. I'm Molly Fitzgerald with Microsoft on the data side. Ah, okay. But the one thing that I think is really interesting is how do we define recidivism? How do we measure? So I'm really curious what the okay. panel has to say to that question. That's, that's, a, that's a good, good data question. Uh, <laughs> Melissa? Or? Well, I, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking when reviewing all of my materials for this event today was who defines recidivism and you know, what does that look like? I think um, that's something that we certainly have to refine um, and, you know, I, so I read these studies and I, and I see how people go through a program or, uh, you know, an organization will rate how effective a program is. Um, but many times they're only looking at the people who actually completed the program fully and then they were watched for a year, two, three years afterward. Or they were cherry picked to participate in the program because they were the most likely to be successful. Um, so that's not what I'm talking about when I say tangible results of an effective program. Um, so recidivism in that person's eyes is much different than what you or I might think. I think that that's something we do have to have a conversation about with the, the people who have the most experience in the education uh, to support their definition. Certainly not me, but I need the information and Senator Steinberg needs the information in order to make an educated um, decision based on that. And maybe Matt would have something to add to that. Uh, well, it, it's a very good question and unfortunately it's incredibly complex. Uh, much more complex than it would appear at first glance. Um, at Corrections, we started measuring it three different ways. Um, arrests, uh, convictions, and returns to prison over one year, two year, and three years. And the reason we did that is because any change in policy, you can manipulate your own results. Right. People don't understand that. So all you have to do to, you know, in, in, in some cases, if you want to reduce convictions, overcrowd the courts. If you want to uh, increase arrests and have your recidivism rate go up, hire more cops. If you want to see the number of technical violations for, for small offenses go down, quit supervising people, right? And so you've got to measure it multiple ways so that you get a good idea. And this is just, again, uh, this is probably my, you know, the elected supervisors are probably like, that costs a ton of money, Kate, shut up. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, you ha but the more data, the better when it comes to this stuff, in, in my, from my perspective, because again, it, it, everything it inter, interacts with each other. And we haven't even started talking about crime rates. That's right. right? Which is now add another 40 sets of, of, uh, of uh, information that could impact the final result. And now you got a problem that even Microsoft could, could sink okay. its teeth into. So. And, and, and Daryl, as you think about mental health programs and, and um, um, all the types of interventions, how do, how do you think about recidivism? How do you, you know, 
Well, I think that there's another measurement which isn't really recidivism, but it's how many people over time measured, I guess, on a per capita basis do you keep out of the systems in the first place? That's, that's really the measurement because once people enter these systems, they're already in that vortex. It's not that they can't be helped or saved or that we can't turn lives around. That's what this whole hour plus has been about and what our work is about. But much better if we can invest the dollar uh, in the 15-year-old or 16-year-old who gets busted the first time uh, and wrap ourselves around them so that they don't become that adult offender. But I will say this about mental health maybe in conclusion, and I don't know, I, don't, I haven't done, the, don't have the data to answer the why to this. But the more work we do in this area and the more resources we put into this, and we've done, we've layered quite a bit now in California, especially compared to other states, the more need and demand there is for services. And I don't know whether that's because we're doing a better job in busting stigma or people are seeking help who otherwise weren't or whether the need is just that great. But our work in this area is not done. If we can get into the mind in a more effective way, I think we can help turn a lot of these problems around. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, uh, it's been a terrific conversation. And I, I want to say a couple of things to the audience um, but before we, we all go our, our, our different ways. Uh, one of the things I heard here today, um, and I think Matt uh, articulated it very, very nicely, but I heard from everyone, is that, you know, there are prisons, there are county jails. Um, this is our problem um, as Californians. It's, um, you know, we're fortunate that we have the kind of representation um, in the Assembly and the Senate um, at the local level uh, that uh, among Democrats and Republicans, committed people that we have, we've seen here today, but, but ultimately um, this is all of our, pro all our problem. And uh, we're all, we all have the responsibility of the fact that, uh, that we neglected this problem. We, we let this problem get to the point, as, as was discussed by um, uh, the woman in the back who asked the question, that things reached a, a really terrible crisis. And, um, and, and, and now we're, we're, we're working our way through this problem. And uh, we're, we're not there yet. We're somewhere um, in the middle of uh, finding our way to a solution, but it sounds like we're making progress. And I was encouraged by some of the things I heard from all of you today in terms of the, the areas in which um, there is some agreement that, uh, of, of what needs to be done. And um, there seems to be a willingness um, on our part to learn from, uh, from, from the experience of funding these programs, uh, which ones are gonna be best in the future. So I, I hope you join me in giving a big round of applause <laughs> to the state senator, the assembly member, and the executive director. Thank you. I wanna thank all of you, remind you to fill out your evaluation forms so that we can collect our data and find out uh, what works at, at our lunches. And uh, thank again the sponsors and everybody else involved today. Thank you.